I'll tell you today about double heat production in the LHC, which is something that I've been working on on and off for the past couple of years, mostly with Christoph uh, and Michael. <laughs> I just want to check the connections. Christopher Michael, and uh, also a paper with Alan, who's an Atlas experimentalist, and Nika, who's a sort of one-loop uh, monster. So there's some you know, vast experimental and theoretical program now dedicated to measuring Higgs couplings now that we know the mass. And a lot of these we have sort of a handle on, both theoretically and experimentally already. So that coupling to fermions, you know, we have sort of access to this through gluon fusion loop. There's some evidence for Higgs to tau tau already. Couplings to the sort of massive vector bosons through its decays uh, and through production through VBF and associated production. Couplings through one loop to things like um, photons and gluons. And the topic of my talk is going to be this guy down here, which is sort of Higgs couplings to itself. So, what I'm interested in is sort of can we measure double Higgs production at the LHC? Uh, can we measure Higgs, the Higgs self coupling at the LHC? And these are sort of related but slightly separate. And is this sort of, you know, interesting at all from the perspective of new physics? Um, or is this just all the blah blah we measure some parameter of the standard model? So just so that we all get off on the same page, so you know, the standard model Higgs Lagrangian is here, and then in unit, you know, the Higgs gets a VEV, and I expand out stuff in unit to re-gauge, uh, and so I get sort of the Higgs only Lagrangian part of the standard model Lagrangian here, right? So we measured this guy a couple of years ago, and then we also have, just like in phi, you know, phi cubed or phi to the four, we have H cubed and H to four interactions, right? So it's a three point. Higgs interaction and a quartic Higgs uh, cell coupling as well. So <coughs> straight away, I can tell you you'll never measure this at the LHC or the ILC or probably any future collider. It's, their cross sections are just like the cross sections with this are tiny, and the cross sections with this are like tiny raised to some power. Um, so we will probably never have experimental access to this. But this character is a different story than we're thinking about. So. Why is it even interesting to think about these things? I mean, you know, this is now some some parameter of the standard model. It's just some number. Right? We don't have any freedom to dial this, so that's something we'd certainly like to go and measure. Furthermore, this is sort of if we can measure this experimentally, we're starting to experimentally resolve the shape of the Higgs potential, right? Not just sort of saying there's a minimum and it's here, you know, and it's sort of quadratic around the minimum, but we can start to sort of resolve in a better way experimentally the actual shape of the Higgs potential, which would just be super cool. Um, and, you know, as much as I love the standard model, I, you know, love to sort of stick a dagger in its heart if I ever got the chance. And sort of measuring the Higgs self-couplings is possibly one way in which you could do this um, through new physics or just through, in some agnostic sense, through introducing higher dimensional dimension six operators. So there's a variety of reasons why this is a, an interesting thing to try and look at. So how do we, how do we measure this parameter and how do we produce two Higgs at the LHC. So the main sort of diagram to produce, to, to, you know, to get this, this vertex here is this, right? So it's gluon fusion, which is just the same as you know, single Higgs production, right? So if, if you omit this, this is just single Higgs production, which is what we're always doing at the LHC. Except now I have this trillion interaction, so I know this guy must be quite a shell, which suppresses it. I also have then a box diagram, and these two guys are actually going to interfere with each other destructively. Um, which is, you know, the cause of some pain, but also kind of interesting. So, in, normally in Higgs physics, you know, we use this so-called HEF model, this Higgs effective theory, where we can just integrate out this loop. And we can do that because MH squared over M top squared is not large, right? Here it's not going to be the case, right? Because I know that this Higgs here is now off-shell, and I have to have two on-shell Higgs in the final state. So, the Higgs effective theory, you know, which I can write down just using low energy theorems, fails quite badly for dihigs production. So, even you can expand it out and identify stuff, it's just not a good way to go. You end up with much, um, far too many events in the high PG tail. Right, so if you want to do this, you have to take these interference into account uh, correctly, and you have to do the sort of, you have to keep all the M top dependence, right? And that's, you know, that's, that's done some time ago already, and is now, and it's a heroic if you want to do it properly. Right, so what kind of cross sections are we then looking at? So this is a plot from our paper. So Tillman and Planning collaborators have calculated this already, like in 2003. Can you try to get rid of that thing? 
I think you just like, can you edit something good? Click on the X. Okay. Oops. No, sorry. Oh, well. That's okay. It's not, it's not a children. Can you drag it out of the way or something? Or? It's okay. So just this is covering up part of your side. Okay. okay, this is gently enhanced. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm, uh, I'm a new Mac person, so I don't know anything about this. Anyway, so here's you know here's the cross section. So we're sort of sitting here experimentally. <laughs> No, I just moved the, the arrow away. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. You're in your experimental getting out. So we're, we're about here experimentally, right? So this is been calculated the cross section some time ago already by planning collaborators, our own collaborators. And you can see that I'm going to normalize the standard model trilinear to one or normalizing everything to the standard model trilinear. So the standard model is now one. And I can just sort of dial it up and down just to see how the, that affects the cross-section. So happily, around where we are, we have sort of reasonable sensitivity by dialing it, say, up and down uh, between zero and two. So that's quite nice. The, so the down, you know, the, the not so nice thing is the cross-section. So the leading order cross-section is 16 femtobarns. So this is like a lot smaller than what you get for single Higgs production. And um, sort of now, the state of the art is that in the large M top limit, the N in the low cross section is 40 plus minus 3.5. Right? This will continue to improve you know, as um, loop people find harder and harder things to do. Um, so this will sort of hopefully get a bit smaller over the next decade as well. Okay, so looking at the, you know, a crucial thing is, you know, for all of the PT of the Higgs, since it's just a two to two process, there's not so many actual parameters that we can actually think to look at before we shower stuff and decay stuff. So the PT of the Higgs is, you know, they're boosted ish, right? The Higgs mass is about, it's, it's, it is 125, and so the peak in this distribution is a bit about that. So, you know, we normally say stuff is starting to be boosted when the mass over the PT is, is order one. So we, these Higgs are a little bit boosted, and the maximum sensitivity that we have. Um, to variations in the cross section is sort of around here. And we can understand that because that triangle diagram has sort of this, this resonant enhancement um, precisely in this region. And as we sort of head out into the tail, we sort of get more box and less triangle. So, in order to, you know, these are part on level plots, right? So I haven't decayed the Higgs in these plots or anything like that. But to actually do real phenomenology, we have to sort of decay the Higgs and shower all the resulting decay products, right? So we have to sort of figure out. How do we hunt for its decay products and reconstruct the Higgs in those? So these are the theoretical Higgs decays, like for 125 GeV Higgs in the standard model. This is you know, what its branching ratios look like. So the largest branching, you know, we have a very small cross section, and that's what drives sort of all of our Higgs physics. Some, somehow you have to find a balance between like a small cross section and being able to actually reconstruct the final state. So the largest branching ratio is BB bar, which is like 60%, but this is really, really hard. Like, you know, even just for single Higgs production because of QCD background. And sort of at the very other end of the, the spectrum, which isn't actually a spectrum, um, you've got like diphotons and diz to four leptons, and that's sort of out, you know, out here at 10 to the minus three or something like that. But these are very, very clean, right? And in between you have W, W, and T. So if we want to sort of think about di-Higgs physics, we have to sort of specify the decays of both of the Higgses. So this means we have sort of a lot, you know, just by combinatorics, we have a lot of different final states that we can think about. On the other hand, a lot of them are going to be sort of uninteresting because, you know, there's no way that we can really reconstruct Higgs to blue blue or something like that. Or we'll just end up with so little cross-section that you can never have enough events even with 3,000 inverse centimeters. So this is all 14 TeV physics with lots of, all, all the inverse centimeters. All of them. So probably the most popular or most uh, well thought about decay channel is BB gamma gamma, right? So one Higgs to BB bar and one into dipole. So um, theoretical studies by a variety of people indicate that you can set constraints with lots of NUMI, like you know, all of the NUMI. Um, but of course, here you're suffering from small Higgs to gamma gamma branching ratio, and the theorists claim that you can get like 40 to 50% uncertainty on the Higgs trilinear. So then everyone was waiting for some time now for the collaborations to say something. An atlas have come out and said, like, they've done an atlas analysis of this, like, you know, a simulation, and they said that for like, for 3,000 inverse centibar, so in like you know, 2032 or something like this, you'll have eight signal events. 
So the entire run of the LHC gives you eight signal events for the standard model, and this is a significance of 1.3 signal for the backgrounds. CMS are more optimistic and they give you about two. Um, but this atlas, I mean, this is quite a conservative analysis. analysis. Um, so hopefully the truth is maybe somewhere in between here. Right, so Atlas then sort of, if you take these results at face value, this would exclude, like, relative to standard model, 8.7 and minus 1.3. So you do that all this stuff down here. Right? So you're, you're not really, you know, you're probing very large deviations from the standard model that you would, if you had, if you had a theory that would probably, like, give you something that is nine times the standard model trillionaire, you'd probably see that somewhere else. There. So, the name of the game then is that we want to consider as many channels as we possibly can and just like at the end of the LHC, stick them all together in order to just get the smallest sort of um, uncertainty we can in the trial here. So given we have this very small cross-section, so this 28.4 is sort of the, the uh, one sigma lower bound of the NLO cross-section, so being conservative on the cross-section front. Look at the largest branching ratios to keep like as much, as many events, as much cross-section as you possibly can and just try and be sort of smart with your reconstruction technique. Sorry, I think this is in detail, but I thought it was more like 40 plus or minus 5 or something. Like that. Right, yeah, so this is NLO, and the 40 is NNLO. Okay. So when we did... Okay, this is a large bit. Okay. Yeah, so when we did it's our studies... probably a little better. Pardon? So it's probably a little better. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So we, yeah, we were conservative on the cross-section before the NNLO numbers came out, which was earlier this year. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can sort of bump all the cross-section numbers up by 30% if you want. But then, being theorists, we almost certainly mismodeled the backgrounds, so you could bump those up by 50% or something. So, yeah, hopefully, it evens out. So, if you do something like peaks to you know peaks peaks to four Bs or BBWW, you, you end up being killed by the standard model, right? So here you have a four B background coming from QCD, which is huge, and for BBWW and also BB Tau Tau, you have a very large background coming from um, TT bar production. Right, so this is you know sort of a very basic mock-up of a, a BBWW analysis that we did. So this is signal over background, and once you've run through all the cuts to try and suppress the background and reconstruct the Higgses, here's about 10 to the minus 4, which is pretty terrible. So you want to do sort of something smarter, keeping as much of that you know lovely di Higgs pi cross section as you can, and exploit somehow the differences between the signal and the background in a smarter way. So there's a you know there's a couple of things you could think of, right? I mean. These Higgses, you know, they're boosted-ish, right? So we know that these, say, tops and these Bs are going to be fairly collimated with each other. Whereas, say, for the TT bar background, that's less likely to be the case. You know, if I, I'm, I'm quite unlikely if I have sort of back-to-back TT bar production to be finding, you know, Bs quite close together and Tau's quite close together or something like that. So moving into that boosted regime and exploiting that is one way that you could try and uh, kill off this TT bar background. The other thing is just trying to, re you know, Come up with some variable that will allow you allow you to reconstruct um, an event as being like more top-like versus Higgs-like. This is tricky because tops are decaying semi-invisibly into a bunch of neutrinos. But you know, there are techniques in order to allow us to reconstruct semi-invisibly decaying resonances um, based around transverse mass and that kind of thing. Right. So taking taking us back now, back to 1981 or something like that. You know, we, to originally discover the the W, the W is also a semi-invisibly decaying particle, right? It decays into, say, a muon and a neutrino. Um, if I produce one W, how do I reconstruct its mass, right? I do that by constructing um, the, this thing called the transverse mass, just using the transverse uh, information in the detector and ignoring the longitudinal stuff. I know that if I construct this transverse mass variable just using the transverse information, then this has to be less than the true mass. So I expect that if I plot on an event-by-event -event basis, this transverse mass, that I should have some kind of edge here, where in the signal I'm not getting any more events above that. So this is like CMS data with very, very small amounts of uh, integrated luminosity. And you can see that here, in, you know, this is new plus and this is new minus, that I'm, you know, it allows you very accurately to sort of characterize things as being, to measure the W mass. But from our point of view, if I were to make a cut in MT above this, I would kill all the events that involve Ws. So what I'd like to do is somehow generalize this to the case where I have two semi-visibly decaying particles, I'd say. And this has been done already. Um, the generalization is the originally named MT2. So the idea is that you, know, you have two semi-visibly decaying particles. So the, trick, the tricky thing is, is that the amount of missing momentum in the event 
is being shared between the neutrinos essentially, but you don't know how much momentum is in each neutrino. You only see the sum. So you, you calculate the transverse momentum um, for each sort of side of the um, event, and then you sort of have to divvy up the missing momentum in all the possible ways that you can. And so if you take the maximum of these and then the minimum of these, then you can show in about a page that this should have a, an edge, just as the transverse momentum does, at the mass of your semi-invisibly decaying resonance. Right? So this, this is a story that's been developed over the past decade by a variety of people, including Alan and Chris Lester. So in our case, if we reconstruct MT2, it should have an edge at the top mass, right? So the background here, which is mostly TT bar background, indeed has an edge around here. There's some smearing from uh, experimental effects, detector effects. And then the dihig signal doesn't really, you know, it's not associated with that top mass scale at all, and it extends out to much larger value of MT2. So making a cut in MT2 is a very efficient way to kill off TT bar background while keeping your signal. So if you look at an analysis for this, so this is for BB Tau Tau, you know, if you just do sort of the the, the dumb analysis, basically just reconstructing the Higgs and the tau tau and dv bar at S over V, you're at sort of 10 to the minus 3. But once you kick in this NT2 and this cut on PT of the dv bar system, then you can get to S over V of about a quarter. Right? The cross sections are small. This is a cross section in femtobars, so 0.047 femtobars means you get 47 events for every thousand inverse femtobars, or about 150 events in the entire lifetime of the LHC. But this corresponds to about 60% sensitivity on variations of that. You could gain further sensitivity by you know, including a hard jet, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. So what about um, what about topness? A topness was some more multivariable way of trying to uh, identify events as being top-like. That's not something we've looked at. But, okay. um, that was uh, Jesse Shelton and collaborators mm -hmm. did this. Um, I thought it was a I don't remember what they were mostly. I think they were they were looking at different kinds of searches. Like they were looking at uh, P prime searches. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what they were originally yeah. looking at. I don't remember. Anyway, it was. But it seemed it was at least billed as a kind of general purpose Swiss Army knife thing for rejecting top events. Yeah. Like top yeah. backgrounds. So it's, I think we'll yeah. Okay. So this plot just shows, like, in terms of the cut you decide to make on MT2 and the cut you make on the PT, the BB bar system, how many inverse center bars you need in order to achieve five sigma observation of dihex production, right? So not a measurement of the trilinear, but just five sigma evidence of dihex production. So you can see that, I mean, for, for weak cuts, you need sort of two experiments. But, I mean, as you make the cut stronger, and we kind of stop the plot here, because otherwise you're just sampling the tails, you can certainly do this with one experiment with like lots of inverse center bars again. So hopefully you could achieve like a five sigma observation of dihex production while achieving some sensitivity on lambda which is smaller. Right? And that's why these things are different. So aside from sort of you know characterizing your events as top-like, um, one other thing you could think about is in terms of trying to exploit the kinematics is the fact that these events are boosted, right? So this is now a fairly well-developed story, going back to BDRS of um, Butterworth and collaborators. <coughs> and what you're trying to exploit is that the signal has these quite collimated BB bar and Chao Chao systems, which are <coughs> approximately back-to-back -back after radiation effects, whereas the TT bar background is less likely to, right? So this is a promising place to use jet substructure techniques. The idea here is that you make one sort of fat jet, one very large jet, which captures all of the decay products of your decaying resonance. So in this case, it's a Higgs, right? So the Higgs decays to BB bar, and maybe one of them radiates a whole wide-angle B1. And then by going one step backwards in your jet reconstruction algorithm and chucking away some of the soft junk from your event, you can very effectively reconstruct the Higgs mass while achieving quite a high rejection rate for QCD-based events. So. You can apply this basically to anything that involves like a BB bar binding state. So the Zurich group of uh, Papa Estazio, uh, Liu Yang, and Jose Zarita has done this for BBWW. So they found that for doing a BBWW analysis, you could get sort of five signal and two and a half background events for 600 inverse center bars. <coughs> the only thing to be slightly cautious about in their analysis is that they made a cut in this parameter called RBBH. So RBBH is, I have, 
you know, first I reconstruct this fat jet, and that has some direction, right? And then eventually I'm going to sort of filter this and recluster it and chuck some stuff away, you know, this soft radiation, and eventually I'll have a reconstructed Higgs candidate, and there's going to be some difference in direction between this fat jet and my reconstructed Higgs candidate, right? A small difference. Um, and what they find is that cutting on that difference is a very effective way to kill the background, right? So all of your signal is sort of off down here, whereas your um, QCD stuff has a much longer tail. And the tricky thing is that, you know, the, our detectors are, are granulated, right? They're not completely smooth things. So an Atlas calorimeter cell has a, um, you know, it has a size that's sort of your, you know, your main, I don't know, pixel kind of thing, not an actual pixel, but think of it that way, of about 0.15. So to do this analysis, you have to sort of achieve sub-calorimetric resolution on differences of these things and get that under control. Maybe that's something we can do, but it's not clear that theorists are the people to be saying things about, you know, the is, actual sub-detector level components. What about CMS? I mean, CMS does this particle CMS flow. CMS could do something like particle flow, and that might work better. Yeah. 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 Is that better for this? It could be. Um, I think it's just something to be careful about. That's it. Like, so this, this cut, think, the, what, what, is, what angular size does this cut, or is it beta, or whatever it is? What so this, this is delta y squared plus delta eta squared. Square. So I should so say square, square, square root of those. Right, okay, so that's essentially the delta, the angle. Yeah. So that is a pretty small cut. I don't remember <laughs> what the angular resolution is. So, okay. I mean, the, so the moral of the story is be careful what you chuck into an NBA, basically. Um, or at least think about what comes out. So then another thing, there's been a lot of action this year on multi-B final states. So uh, these people, so Michael and you know, everyone is now working with each other. So this is Michael and Pavel Sazi from Zurich and this guy's an Atlas postdoc. Looked at the 4B final state again, which previously people thought was a terrible idea. So they looked at sort of double fat jets, so like a BDRS squared style analysis with some fancy uh, shower deconstruction stuff that Michael's been working on at Dave Silver. And their claim is that you can constrain lambda to be less than 1.2 times the standard model at 95% confidence level. Um, these people, two different groups, have looked at TTHH production. So here you have uh, two tops, and the Higgs's are going to 4B. So you have five or six B tags, right? So this is a very B-full event. Uh, and they find that you can get lambda less than 2.51 times the standard model. These are numbers with 3,000 full these are, LHC. 3, these are all full LHC numbers. So like 20 years time or something like that. So then our analysis, we looked at BB Tau Tau, and this is a sort of a similar story. You have two Taus reconstructing the Higgs, a fat jet in BDRS style, and once you apply these sort of fat jet and Higgs reconstruction cuts, you're at sort of signal over background of about a half. And again, it's sort of crucial that you're using um, all these fat jet cuts in order to sort of improve these things. So again, if you're looking at a handful of events, that you have sensitivity, again, at about the 50% level. So, can, and just to compare, can you go back just to compare yeah. apples to apples? Because like, you know, we were interested in this number of like a 20% yeah. deviation yeah, yeah. from the standard model. And like, that, that was, <coughs> oh, sorry, lambda less than that. So I'm a little confused because, um, see, doesn't, isn't it the case that when lambda is bigger than the standard, is, is smaller than the standard model, the event rate goes up? Not at, um, so I'm confused about why you have an upper bound on... In this case, for TTHH production, that's not the case. Okay. TTHH is interesting okay, so because that, that that making I'm, it large. This might right, be the wrong way around. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, guess, I don't know anything about TTH. But yeah. TTH is, is interesting because um, it, go, it goes the other way, yeah. basically. But why is it, yeah, this one here, it seems, isn't it? Backwards or something. You'd expect know. lambda to be greater than the standard model because that's a smaller. It's a destructive interference, so yeah. the event rate actually goes up if lambda is smaller for a while, I guess. I mean, and eventually, of course, it would. It would uh, no, if lambda goes up, the event rate goes down. Right. Yeah. So but that's why that doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. Upward is upward. Right. So this should be. There's also, I mean, if it's just the fact that it's a 20%, whichever way it goes, I was originally struck by the fact that it's a 20% deviation, which seems pretty good. So yeah, I, I mean, this of is course, it's, it's exclusion. It's 95% confidence level, so it's exclusion, not yeah. discovery. But that means that in some sense, you are starting to probe 
a 20 percent deviation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm personally, I'm slightly surprised. I mean, I'm not on the board. Personally, I'm slightly surprised at this number. It's like it's very close to one, whereas right. in an extremely difficult, like the most difficult final stage, right. um, whereas everything else okay. tends so to be like that. Okay, it would be nice to know which way these are going. Yeah, probably keep it up. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so again, you're getting order fifty percent here. So another thing you can <clears throat> one one reason that using these, I mean, these boosted final states and boosted techniques have proved very useful for suppressing the background. Um, but one reason that they're like a little bit maybe non-optimal or could be improved upon is that like to use the boosted stuff, if you just don't imagine that this blue line exists at all, if you're thinking about the triangle diagram, to make these things more and more boosted, you have to sort of have more and more momentum flowing through these offshot heaps, which is sort of suppressing that triangle you know, contribution, and you're getting more boxes way out on the IPT tail, basically. So it would be really cool if you could um, probe this sort of part of the trial, that triangle diagram near resonance where you know you have maximum sensitivity to the trilinear and then just kick that off some radiation so that you're achieving like maximum sensitivity because you're producing it in principle near resonance and then just boosting it off some really hard jet of ISR basically. So you can do that if you think about dihex plus jet production. But you have a similar effect for the background. I mean the TT bar background could also be boosted by recording from the blue one. Yeah. Right? And so then it makes it, it makes it hard. Is it, is it obvious why this should be better relatively? Well, it's, it's, it's be better, well, better is like some entirely subjective thing, of course. I mean, the, the, the reason to think about it is because it should ideally give you, on a purely signal level, more sensitivity just in the cross-section to variations in the trolley. And then S over B is something else to worry about. I guess in the TT in the background you don't you have an effect where your uh, for a given say total PT or something you don't have to be as uh, as off shell for the for the, that's the, for idea, the yeah. so that you're actually so maybe that's the reason the signal gets enhanced yeah, yeah. it's less suppressed than the background when it is boosted that's sort of a good idea okay. and so you can so these are cross section plots for 100 G VJ and 20 G VJ. Um, so of course, adding in an extra hard jet into the game is the price to pay, which is that the cross section goes down to order a few uh, GEV. There's no NLO number for this yet, but you know you're looking at order 10 femtobarns versus order a few femtobarns, really. But um, so this, this, the, the rough idea approximately works so that you get a larger dependence on variations in lambda um, if you include this hard jet than you do without the hard jet. So the 50 percent sort of double the sensitivity just in the signal cross section. But of course you can't just measure the signal, you have to come up with an analysis. This was the number that was somewhere near thirty before you added the jet. So just how much uh, so this was yeah so this was before I added well this these these are leading order numbers because we don't have an NLO calculation okay. of PC's jet yet. So this was sixteen in leading order. Okay. And then it goes down for a hard jet to like three. Um, so yeah, so like Marcus was saying, your sensitivity is not coming from configurations with two Higgses close to each other. Um, but again, in terms of background, you'll also get configurations where you have, say, two tops recording against a jet or something like that. So definitely everything is going to be overlapping in your detector. So you're going to want to use some kind of substructure again to, to get rid of these, um, well, to distinguish the Higgses possibly from their own overlapping radiation and from so, you know, 4B plus jet doesn't work. BB tau tau seems to work uh, reasonably well still. But if you reconstruct um, the Higgses using these BDRS techniques and make a cut in the dihigs invariant mass, you have a really tiny cross section. So this is like uh, six events per thousand inverse central bar. So now that's sort of approximately BB gamma gamma levels, but you have a pretty good uh, S over B. And, well, no experimentalists have studied this, but certainly one of the theory group um, has come to similar sort of results. Moving on, I mean, you know, why study Higgs Higgs plus two jets? When, when does this sort of nonsense ever end? Higgs Higgs plus two jets is actually quite interesting for the same reason that di single Higgs plus two jets is, namely that you're starting to probe BBF. Right? So this is the leading order process which is sensitive to WWHH and ZZHH interactions. And so in particular, say in 
composite Higgs with strong interacting models, you can get very large deviations from the standard model phenomenology. So it'd be nice to try and measure this. You know, in in an idealized future, we imagine that we measure the trilinear in PT to HH, and then we could even start to try and maybe become sensitive to these. This future is very idealized. Um, so the tricky thing about this is, like, similar to Higgs, just Higgs plus two jets, there are contributions coming from gluon fusion, right? We can't just pick out the events we want, and there are large gluon fusion components which have to be calculated and kept under control. And this is very hard here because you're calculating um, a two to four process at one loop. Why, um, gluon, um, why do you have alphas? In, why are you, I'm just confused what you're talking when you're talking about gluon fusion. Why do you have uh, alpha? This alpha, 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 alpha well, this should be y. Oh, this is yeah. alpha top, sorry, okay. Right. So, again, the gluon fusion, you know, this, you can imagine just trying to calculate it in this effective theory, which again, doesn't work very well. Um, so you should, you should do this like, by calculating the whole loop dot graph, which is where someone like Nico Greiner is very useful. But this is very hard still, right? Because if you imagine something like glue glue to Higgs Higgs glue glue, this is two to four, and it's like a hexagon diagram, plus all of its friends. So there's an awful lot of finite diagrams, and it takes very long time to integrate even perhaps one phase space point. So for the most like weird configurations, up to a minute. So if you're just doing some traditional Monte Carlo, this is very unpromising because you'll write the rest of your life to generate events in order to analyze. So what we've done is we've opted to reweight the events. So we generate the events in the effective theory with the top mass, with the top integrated out, and then on a point by point or an event by event basis, you calculate the amplitude for that. Configuration, and you reweight it based on the on the, uh, the amplitude that you calculate. So in principle, this should work reasonably well. Like one place that might not work is that if there's parts of the phase space of the full theory, which you know make some contribution to the cross section, which are not sampled in the effective theory, for instance. But we haven't found any um, anything on our plot that suggests that's happening. So again, you can see that in the effective theory, you're just getting you're not resolving the top mass of the, the, the top in the loop, and so you end up with a much harder PT spectrum than you would otherwise, you know, by factors of you know, lots. So now that we have a semi-reliable calculation for the first time of this um, PP to Higgs Higgs jet jet, we can sort of try and put together a very basic analysis. So this analysis, you know, you ask for um, some sort of jet cuts, two B jets, and two extra jets. So two Bs coming from a Higgs and two other jets, which are going to be these kind of four jets that we usually think about in DBF analyses. And we haven't like flashed this up at all yet in terms of using MT2 or Topness or BDRS or whatever. That's something we're actually just doing, at the, we're just starting at the moment. So there's a couple of things to look at here. So one is that, you know, the sort of the, the number down here is a very single over background. This is a very small number. This is not a large number at all. But we'll try and improve that. And then the other thing is, so the columns here for the signal um, are just for the VBF component, right? And then the last one includes the gluon fusion component. So you can see that you know, the VBF numbers are small, but the gluon fusion numbers are in fact somewhat larger. So it's not a very consistent thing to just assume that you know, we can kill the gluon fusion component and just to study the VBF, which is what has been kind of the dumb thing until now. So you know, this is an area that's still sort of developing now that we're having these calculations become available for the first time that we can well, hopefully make this number larger um, and make this number smaller at the same time. Are there, are there any, I mean, we, we already know that the, the HWW coupling is, is pretty standard model like, right? So is there a way you could change the HHWW but not change the Yeah, that's what I was my question. So, I mean, I'm not, not sure. sure how excited I would be. I mean, this is a hard measurement, right? I'm just not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's a hard measurement, but we have to do something in 20 years' time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think. I don't, I, I don't off the top of my head, I, yeah. I would think it would be, be pretty hard to, to have a large deviation this is, there. This is in some way, I mean, a difficulty as well, but these are all sort of lifetime measurements of the LHC. Um, and while you can think sort of now or two years ago or something that 
maybe you can have large deviations in this. Of course, the more information you get on single Higgs, the more that will constrain in general double Higgs. Because I mean, that's the that's the nice thing about the Higgs cubic coupling is it actually it can it's an have thing. a huge yeah. deviation yeah. even given all the other things that we yeah. know now. It's already you know. Whereas I'm not sure that this. I'd have to think, but I doubt it somehow. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course, course you still have a problem with extra linear in this as well. I mean, it's not, not so obvious. Okay, I mean, no. yeah. I mean, I think you're probably right, but this is still sensitive to the trilinear as well, right? So, mm -hmm. level of order two. So, just then for the last sort of five or ten minutes, maybe I'll try and convince you that there is something in, in well, I guess some of you already convinced about this since you wrote a paper last week on it, um, that there's something in sort of Dihex physics from the point of, of BSN which is what we talk about. There's sort of some relevance there. Um, so how might we want to alter Dihigg's phenomenology um, by introducing some new, new physics? So we'll just, you know, if we look at our old friend with the triangle diagram here, I mean, this guy here, this standard model Higgs is off-shell, so one thing I could do is I just introduce here some new resonance called a capital H, which I produce on-shell, which just decays into a pair of standard model Higgs, right? a Dihigg's resonance or something like that. And there's loads of different theories which give you this kind of stuff, right? So two Higgs doublet models, um, you know, which includes Susie, Higgs portal stuff, composite models. So there's sort of a wide variety of theories which involves the you know, new di Higgs resonances, um, which are interesting to study. And then the other sort of set, well, another thing you could do, of course, is just to change this, right? That's <coughs> the most obvious thing to do, is just to change the value of that. So that's number one, this is number two. And then, you know, it's a loop, so the other, you know, straightforward thing to do is you put some new junk in the loop. We've been doing this kind of game for years. So anything with sort of some kind of heavy top partners, maybe like Susie, but certainly like composite Higgs models, and let's not even mention these anymore. So, you know, there's certainly parts of Susie parameter space <coughs> where for this capital H, this some um, this, you know, other CP even Higgs, Higgs H I mean, it'd be great if like this had a different pronunciation from this. Where H to H H can be a, the dominant decay term. So this in particular happens for the mass of this is sort of between 2m Higgs and, and 2m top, basically. You can just say the big H louder. Yeah. I'll, I'll shout H. I had, a, I had, a, I had a, a instructor who taught GR, and he, he said upper indices in a high voice and lower indices in a low voice. That's awesome. It's like tonal, right? That's right. Like, <laughs> that's quite smart. <laughs> um, right, so... For some sort of specific mass range and for low tan beta, so that you don't have this guy just decaying into bees all the time, you know, this branching ratio can be you know, 50% or 70% or something like this. And although you know, this is Higgs production is getting contributions also from the standard model, you can sort of separate it out reasonably effectively with a cut from the Higgs invariant mass. Right? So here's this lovely, in principle, um, Higgs resonance. Here's you know, basically the standard model stuff where the like, external propagators off shell and put in principle, one would like try and separate those out. And if you can do that, then you can, you know, constrain separately, one would hope, the values of lambda h h h, lambda h h h, um, and using that, you maybe could then sort of start to constrain beta alpha or something like this. So, you know, for some sort of benchmark point that we looked at, for a 290 GeV m h, you know, the cross section is up by the standard model by a lot, like a factor 10 because it's on shell and quite narrow. And the branching ratio is order of 50%. Um, but of course, these things become more and more constrained the more data we get. But there, you know, there is now like a dedicated. You know, I think both collaborations are now have Higgs resonance searches, which is great. So similar things happen, say in the Higgs portal, where you know I note that this operator, or phi dagger h by h, is a singlet, so I can couple you know, some singlet to that. So I couple to the singlet scalar field with some hidden sector. And then if they both get bevs and they mix together, so I then have a H and a big H, and I have a bunch of trilinears I can study again, and I get sort of similar stuff that I did in the uh, the two Higgs double model. So again, you want this guy to be more massive than, tw than twice the Higgs mass. PP to two Higgses, which is like 44 femtobarns, or three times standard model. But you could also think about like producing a big H and a little H and then looking for like three Higgses in the final state. But these are very small cross-sections, so maybe this isn't actually something that will, will succeed at all. 
Um, right. So then, you know, Susie is sort of the contributive or weekly couple way to think about solving the hierarchy problem. And the main other thing that we think about is sort of strong interactions, right? So the idea is that I have it some sort of higher scale, some multi TV scale, some strong interacting sector, and out of this emerges some light scalar degree of freedom, which is kind of natural if that light scalar is a pseudo nabu boson boson of some broken symmetry. Right? So examples of say the pseudo dilaton, where it's a PG of some broken scale symmetry, which I won't talk about because I don't think it works anymore, and the composite Higgs. So the idea of composite Higgs, I mean I'm not trying to tell you composite Higgs today, you all know probably more about it than me. Um, is that sort of I gauge the electroweak interactions of a subgroup of some larger broken symmetry group, right? So I'm just going to embed these into the SO4, which is an emerging person in the SO5, which is broken. So then I get some number of of bosons from this breaking. These get masses at one loop from Coleman Weinberg, um, which become my hazes. And deviations from standard model behavior of these Higgses, of the, the, the lightest Higgs, is measured by this parameter of psi or C or this, this Greek letter whose name I don't know. Um, over, over to V over F, right? So V is sort of the standard model of Higgs F, and F is something like the pi and decay constant of that hidden sector. And the, the law is basically that as I make this smaller and smaller, I'm increasing the tuning of my models. So you can have sort of in these models, so this is for a model, uh, this is for MCHM5, um, you can have like, you know, wild and you know, exotic deviations from standard model Higgs phenomenology, um, which of course we now know is not really being realized. So this is a paper from like late 2012. So we took psi from 0.25, which was allowed then, although I think the constraints are now much smaller. So these are interesting, these models from the point of view of the Higgs phenomenon, because you get these new four-point interactions and these non-diagonal interactions, which means they tops and top partners and stuff in the third family. You get you know a non-standard model trilinear, so you, you know, change the trilinear. And then you have extra stuff in the loop. So there's a whole bunch of competing effects which can change dihigs and dihigs plus jet physics um, through stuff in the loop and, and changing the actual training here itself. So, you know, at its most sort of optimistic, you could increase the cross section by maybe a factor of three or four. And this increase in the cross section is mostly due to enhancements in the high PT tail because these are sensitive to the new heavy sort of fermions. So these boosted searches will sort of see an increase in cross-section proportionally larger than that. Sorry, so, back, I mean, from your previous expressions, it looked like, if you go back, back one, it looks like <coughs> this non-standard trilinear is, is an effect that decouples when V over F gets large. So yes. Yes. Is, yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, you should get standard model. I don't right back. see how you could get a factor of three. I mean, now right, but it's not it just coming from the trilinear, trilinear right? It's also coming from the stuff. Okay, so that's... Really yeah. Okay. Right. And well, I don't have it, but you can kind of see that if you look at the PT distributions, right? They sort of go up with a TV or one and a half TV, mm -hmm. depending on the mass of the, the top part that you put in. Mm -hmm. So if you you know think back 20 slides to this Higgs, Higgs plus jet search I talked about, this, you get a cross section now of 13 femtobarns, um, which is sort of four and a bit times the standard model, which would give you an S over B of seven. Right. But again, this is sort of very far in the future, so you'd have constrained these theories sort of much further already. So I guess the take home from this is that you know, if, you, if you're interested in Dihigg's physics um, as a probe of new physics, like Dihigg's resonances is the way to go, or direct changes of the trilinear. And just putting extra stuff in the loop, you'll have probed over you some other way. This stuff will be probed by T prime searches, right? So two, the limits mm -hmm. on these will also we'll be also go. off by yeah, yeah. T prime searches. Yeah, so there's direct searches with the top parts. So some of the, I don't know, the message, if you're now you know, back awake, is that sort of Dihigg's physics is now sort of starting to catch up with, with single Higgs physics on the, the sort of the theory and phenomenological side, right? So there's been studies of a whole variety of different production mechanisms, gluon fusion, TTHH, BBF, and a whole bunch of different final studies. So the current sort of projections from theorists is that you get 30 to 50% accuracy on the trilinear coupling from the lifetime measurement. But, I don't know. This, this will continue to evolve up and down, but you know, hopefully this statement will remain roughly. Wait, yeah. we're doing by lifetime measurement? Like 3,000 years into the The lifetime of the Oh, lifetime of the LHC. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we're measuring a lifetime. That's what Ah, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, the lifetime right. of the LHC before it decays. Yeah. Um, and in terms of 
you know, BSM physics, there's quite a rich BSM phenomenology, um, but if you're, again, if you're looking at, you know, far in the future, dihex resonances and actual direct changes are charting here on the way to go. Okay, so thanks for your time. Questions for Mark? Um, if you are too shy to ask questions now, you can always come to our office. They're not scary at all. Maybe this one. <laughs> what is the typical scale um, of, of the interaction, basically, of, of the Higgs reading around? Assuming there would be a significant running. I mean, in the future. Uh, I, I mean, which. Uh, uh, at which scale would you pick the this coupling, this really arm coupling? This, if, assuming you you, pull, you have a strong strongly coupled model where the this really arm is, is running in a significant fashion. I mean, okay, I, I don't know. Maybe we can. Yeah, not much. I understand. It's not really. Okay. I mean, if there's if strong, strong interactions at and yeah. here. There might be strong interactions at higher scales, but if there's no strong interactions yeah, at yeah. and Higgs, then it's just a parameter that, oh, that so doesn't that have any running. So it's it's fixed by some weird strong dynamics. But oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not a question of I think radio corrections. Yeah, but that was also thinking, I don't know, of other operators that could also have a derivative in the, have more Higgs and derivatives in in this uh, effective form. Or it, in principle, it would be dependent on the, on the momentum the mm -hmm. flowing through the binary coupling. But I don't, I don't know if it's okay. It's well, I mean, maybe your question then is in terms of uh, higher dimension operators. I mean, if you just put in, um, you know, h to the sixth interaction or something, yeah. some dimension six thing. I mean, I, I mean, do you, you you can get some constraint. On that, I guess from this, right? Yeah. Not terribly strong because you can't. Oh. Yeah, but some, there'll be some constraint, I guess. But this is like the way to probe that yeah. operator. Not sure, by the way. So, so when you do the 14 TV thing, so are all of this search many statistically dominant? I mean, for the one. It, 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 it's 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 mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because you do a signal versus big one. That's yeah, yeah. by assuming it's just a statistics. Um, so, 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 I don't know anything about systematics, right? Yeah, you can <laughs> so, so there's no, I see. So there's no current search you can kind of so see how serious. So. so, for example, like the dihigs, you, you say there's a dihigs resonance search. Um, yes. Do they have a result yet, or is they just have a result? So they're looking for like a 4B resonance, basically. Right. So for this kind of search, it's usually uh, systematic. Sorry, statistics it's just don't have. It's just like 20 counterbalance, 20 percent of rounds at 8 TV. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to scale 20 percent of rounds at 8 TV to 3,014, and you're looking at a different bias there as well. So how easy that is. Maybe one way to ask a question. I think in the projections. So the projections that Atlas and CMS did, they did them for, for, for snow mass, uh, at least originally. They, uh, <coughs> they, they did include systematics, but they, they did some scaled systematics. You know, they, they, they assumed that at the luminosities, these high luminosity systematics would improve. You know, and that, I mean, like one the thing you could do is, yeah, that was a, there was an optimistic and a pessimistic assumption. I mean, there were but anyway, one could just ask how big of a role did systematic errors play in their analysis, right? I mean, I don't know the answer, but that's one could see that, and that's I think the only place where anybody I don't know if I said. Yeah, so yeah, you could look at this. We could look at this Atlas thing from a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. right? So there is now one Atlas projection that we have in the center class that we began. And I can't remember what they've done with systematics, um, but basically none of the theory papers are really about systematics. Oh. Okay. Okay, so if there's no more questions, then thanks, uh, Matt.